Don't blink. You'll want to keep your eyes peeled for all the gory goodness in today's movie. <laughs> Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Dario Argento's Baroque splatter flick, Opera. Released in 1987, Opera is essentially one of Argento's last truly great films. It comes at the tail end of a cinematic outburst that started with Deep Red and included Suspiria, Inferno, Tenebrae, and Phenomena. It was a period wherein Argento cemented his reputation as a horror auteur and it remains one of the greatest creative stretches the genre has ever seen. The film's over-the-top kills, the crazy camera work, and Roddy Taylor's moody cinematography all combine to create one of the most insane and absurd Italian horror films of the 1980s. But is it splattery? Let's get to the gore and find out! Right off the bat, we know this is a Dario Argento movie because we open with this shot of a bird's eye in an opera house. Talk about a bird's eye view. Hey, there's Urbano Barberini. He was last seen on Sick Flicks in Demons. Wonder if he'll hop on a motorcycle and ride through the aisles chopping up opera fans in this movie. Fingers crossed. And there's Daria Nicolodi, Argento's one-time muse and last seen here in Tenebrae and Phenomena. And Coralina Cataldi Tassoni, who had the worst birthday party ever in Demons 2. At any rate, this bird isn't a fan of the rehearsal, which earns him the ire of Diva Mara Chakova. <laughs> Oh my god, no, no! Maestro, please, let's take it from ah. me as You might even say he's ranting and raving. But hey, Mara can dish it out too. She's not a fan of this production of Macbeth either. We have a problem? Yes, you! This isn't one of your crummy movies! So, this film was another sort of autobiographical riff by Argento. He actually attempted to direct an adaptation of Rigoletto, but that never happened. Reportedly because Argento wanted to alter the source material to fit his macabre sensibilities and the producers got cold feet. As such, opera essentially became his way to create the musical he never got the chance to make. Also, if you're wondering why we never see Mara Chakova, it's because originally Argento wanted Vanessa Redgrave in the part. But she was unavailable. He then reduced the character's role in the movie. At any rate, she probably shouldn't walk out of this place backwards. She can't possibly see where she's going. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Mara Chakova has been knocked down by a car! <gasps> see? You gotta watch where you're walking. From there, we jump over to this apartment, where Argento just makes answer on the phone seem ominous. And it is ominous, because this creepy version of Pharrell Williams is on the other end of the line asking some very existential questions. Are you happy? Look, Pharrell, I've asked you to please stop calling me. I just don't agree that a room without a roof is a good example of happiness. Good day, sir. Turns out, this is Betty, Mara Chakova's understudy and one of the least inspiring slasher film heroines to ever grace the screen. Turns out the caller was right about one thing, though. Betty's about to get her big break as Lady Macbeth. Daria Nicolodi breaks the news. Come on, Betty. Come on. Get ready. In exactly one hour, you've got to be on stage. Mara Chikola has had an accident. Too bad Betty's not excited about her newfound fame, though. It's the opera. Macbeth brings bad luck. They dip out, but someone's peeping from the vents, which gives us this cool Argento transition to the opera house. While there's pure chaos backstage, someone's prowling around on the balcony. <laughs> Hmm, skulking about, black gloves, this must be our killer. Down on the stage, Betty's giving it her all. This is the best lip sync I've seen since Millie Vanilli. Do you guys even remember Millie Vanilli? Christ, I'm old. Also, what's with this costume? She Lady Macbeth or cosplaying a goth C-3PO? You finally return. Yeah, definitely goth C-3PO. And it wouldn't be an 80s Argento film if we didn't cram in a weird flashback out of nowhere, so here we go. Guess that'll make sense later or something. Look, it's Dario Argento. Just roll with it. Unfortunately for our killer, he's been busted trying to move into some better seats than the ones he paid for. Excuse me, sir. I'm gonna need to see your ticket. And someone took the whole bring down the lights thing a little too literally. Back in the booth, things are escalating. Ticket taker dude's getting the hook. Literally. 
You know what they say, though. The show must go on. Stay where you are. Keep your positions. Don't keep go going. Back to your room. It was an accident. Nothing more, okay? Betty's a little shook up, so this Raven's gonna help her with her lines. Psst. The next verse starts with O R two. The crowd seems less than enthused. This is the weirdest version of Star Wars since the Christmas special. After the show, Betty has questions. What about the accident with the lights? The shouting and the screaming. What shouting and screaming? Yeah, someone kept shouting, do Freebird, for the whole last act. You guys didn't hear him? Then we get what basically passes as exposition in an Argento movie. The only bad luck Macbeth has brought to you is fame. I know. My mother was a singer. Remember that for later. It's worth mentioning here that the director Margo is played by actor Ian Charlson, who was best known for his work in Chariots of Fire and Gandhi. He passed away from AIDS in 1990, but does a really great job as Argento's avatar in this film. Betty's about to dip out, but she runs into the Clark Kent version of Urbano Barberini. Ah <laughs> yes, Urbano, you look so scholarly in those glasses. Alan's a big fan of the opera, but surprise, he's also a cop. Everything is ready, Inspector, and they're all waiting for you. Betty is not pleased by this. So you are a policeman, not a fan. Can't a policeman be a fan? What is it with you guys and the philosophical questions? Did Pharrell send you? She ditches him, but then the stage manager shows up. At least his game is a little better than Inspector Santini's. And, um, looks like I'm the last one to congratulate you. So you think it'd be okay if I had a kiss? And she gets a gift from Mara Chakova. What do you think it is? Who knows? Look, it's yellow and it's warm. It's probably pee. Then we get this shot of a throbbing brain, and you know what that means. It's time for a flashback. There's some light bondage happening here, and a big knife. Hope you kids remembered a safe word. And back in the present, it appears our killer has kept his toys and wants to play with Betty. I bet they're gonna make some sweet music together. Later that night, the killer breaks into the theater. Don't mind me, I'm just gonna make some alterations to Betty's dress. The ravens break free and this guy's like, hey, you need a hand with that? But the killer's all like, nevermore. The birds are displeased by this murder of crows. Or ravens. You've made a very powerful enemy today, sir. Back in our main movie, Betty and the stage manager have hooked up. With disastrous results. According to the legend, opera singers are incredibly horny. Oh man, you already got her in the sack. You can quit running game now. Christ. She's busy basking in the afterglow, but surprise, our killer's here. He ties her up and gags her so she can't say the safe word, and then tapes these sharp needles under her eyes so she can't avoid watching what's coming next. And this is as good a time as any to point out that Argento conceived this gruesome idea as a joke for the audience members who covered their eyes or looked away during his murder set pieces. Insieme ai biglietti bisogna vendere delle scotch, pezzettini di tape, scotch tape, che con degli aghetti già applicati che si devono applicare qui agli occhi prima di entrare nel film. Così quando a un certo punto c'erano scene che uno vorrebbe chiudere gli occhi, provava a chiudere e aveva la puntura degli aghi e if you guess she's gonna have to watch the stage manager get murdered, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. The killer shows us why he flunked out of dental school by jamming his knife right into the dude's mouth. Worst teeth cleaning ever. Then he stabs him repeatedly on the floor. Look man, you seem like a pretty nice guy, but I'm still gonna have to murder you. With his work done, he cuts Betty loose and bails. Sorry, gotta run. You're gonna have to clean this up yourself. Well, she's out calling the cops, she's picked up by Marco. Could he be the killer? My God, look what success has done to you. Come on, I'm gonna get the papers. Well, if he's not, he's definitely still pretty creepy. Well, you know, you Sopranos are famous for, um... <gasps> Whoring around? I went, but I went. This scene is a great example of why non-Argento fans are so confounded by the love his work receives. Betty was just attacked and witnessed a brutal murder, and here she's in a car with Marco having this completely ridiculous conversation and never even mentions the murder. It's absurd, but it's also vintage Argento. That's true. I always joke off before I should have seen. TMI, man. Back at her place, she finally gets around to mentioning the murder and adds this detail. All the terrible things I saw. 
Or from a nightmare I used to have as a child. The next day, Inspector Santini's on the case of the dead birds. It's like Law and Order, Animal Murder Unit. Look, it's been a slow week for homicides, and since I have free time, I'm gonna investigate who murdered your ravens. Oh yeah, and I probably should handle that whole murdered stage manager thing too, I guess. Don't worry though, this guy knows how to get to the bottom of the case. Oh, ravens are very vindictive. They don't forget. They remember for years and years, and at the right moment, zap! What? It's no crazier than Jennifer Connelly telepathically communicating with insects. And here's Argento once again answering his critics through a character. I'd be very interested to know your opinion. I think it's unwise to use movies as a guide for reality, don't you, Inspector? Man, even Marco's girlfriend is starting to suspect him. All this turns you on, doesn't it? What are you talking about? You're a sadist. Oh, really? No, I'm not, but I did direct a movie about the Marquis de Sade once. Later on, Julia's down here fixing the dress. She's got 99 problems, but a stitch ain't one. Look, most of my puns are just so-so, but that one was pretty great. Then she finds a clue. She's off to find a magnifying glass, and if you guessed the killer was going to show up again, give yourself another screenwriter's credit. I found it. He grabs her and gets to work. He might be into sewing too, because he seems to be following a pattern here. Oh my god! Julia and the killer fight for the bracelet, and she's like, look, I really want to iron out our differences. She puts him down for the count, but rather than finish him off, she unmasks him. Yeah. Bad idea. <laughs> the killer then gets the upper hand and is like, shears to you. But this causes Julia to swallow the bracelet. <laughs> While the killer's digging around, Betty's got her eyes peeled. Since it's not in Julia's mouth, our killer has to use some cutting-edge technology to open her up. And this scissorectomy is a complete success. When he's done, he's all like, it's time to cut ties, and then bounces. Freed, Betty goes to see Inspector Santini. These marks, who did this to you? Have you been doing rope bondage again? Why didn't you tell me? Because I knew you'd be weird about it like this. I promise we'll do everything we can to catch this man. But I need your collaboration. I'm working on an opera of my own. I need a female lead. You in? Betty heads home, but she's got a police guardian. Then Daria Nicolodi shows up. Now I understand why the police are keeping an eye on you. Who told you that? What? That the police are keeping an eye on me. The officer downstairs in the hall. Uh-oh. Not sure who to trust, they hide out in the kitchen, which is lit in Suspiria Vision. I'm gonna allow that, it's an Argento movie. Things get even more complicated when someone claiming to be the cop shows up at the door. Why should I trust you? You could be the maniac! I'm a cop, damn it, I'll tell you my identification! Which brings us to one of Opera's most infamous scenes. While Daria Nicolodi's peeping through the peephole, the killer blasts her right through the eye and out the back of her head. The bad news here is she's down an eye. The good news is she can be a pirate every Halloween. While they're playing cat and mouse in the dark, Betty finds the real cop. <laughs> and yeah, that's McKelly Suave making another sick flicks appearance. Hey, remember the peeper in the vents from the start of the film? Yeah, that's still part of this movie. Turns out it's the neighbor girl and she saves Betty. <laughs> Come up here! Quickly! Quickly, come on! Eventually, Betty winds up back at the opera house, where she conveniently runs into Marco again. What are you doing here? Mark, did you hear what happened? Yes, I phoned your apartment. I spoke to a policeman. Argento sure is working overtime to sell you this red herring. It's like he's a pescatarian with a seafood truck. But the whole point of this scene is to reveal that Marco has a plan. You have an eyewitness. And if the maniac's in the audience tomorrow night, I got it. Hey, remember that flashback from way back at the beginning of the movie? Well, it's time to revive that narrative thread. Here, this little girl sees not only the tied-up woman and the woman being killed, but spots the masked killer as well. 
And if you guessed that little girl was Betty, well, no screenwriter's credit for that. That's the point of the whole scene. Is that you, Mommy? The next night, the opera's going great, until Marco puts his plan into motion. <laughs> Remember that bit earlier about the Ravens being eyewitnesses? Well, Marco's gonna turn them loose to find the killer in the audience in one of Opera's most audacious sequences. And seriously, this is what I love about Argento. His ideas might be batshit crazy, but he commits to them 100%. We get a bird's eye view of the plays from Raven Cam. Argento and cinematographer Ronnie Taylor achieved the effect by mounting a camera to a giant spinning crane that lowered toward the audience as it spun. It's the spiritual successor to the Lumacrane sequence in Tenebrae. Eventually, Wes Raven finds his man and the birds swarm. And it's... Inspector Santini! <laughs> Never trust the cops in a Dario Argento film. It's like Panic at the Disco, only at the opera, and Betty flees back to her dressing room. Except Santini is waiting for her so he can deliver some exposition. She taught me a cruel little game of killing and torturing. Only that I have her. Yeah, they were into some kinky shit. And basically, Santini wants to keep the game going with Betty now that the mother's dead. <laughs> but there was something missing. Only this time, he's gonna blindfold her instead of make her watch because he's about to do his best Jim Morrison impression and light his fire. I wanna burn. No one will ever find me. The catch is, he wants her to shoot him first, but not before some more exposition. I strangled your mother. She was too greedy. She wanted more blood, more cruelty, and she wouldn't let me touch her. And then he goes up like a meth lab. <laughs> And that's the end of Santini. We then jump to the Swiss Alps, where Betty's recovering with Marco. Or maybe he's shooting a Phenomena remake. Who can say? Betty heads out, but Marco learns that Santini's not actually dead. Well, the police now inform us that the charred remains of the body they had presumed were Santini's are not, in fact, human at all. And even better, he's here in the house. Extremely dangerous. The police forces of neighboring countries and Interpol... I'll just say, this is a weirdly absurd ending coming up. It's basically like Dario Argento's metal version of The Sound of Music. Betty flees with Santini and Marco in pursuit. While well, he's using Marco as a knife block, Betty has an epiphany. I wanted you to win. To kill him. Except it's all a ruse. She's like, I'm gonna play some headbanging rock music for you as she beans him and then the cops show up. He's already mounting his insanity defense. I DIDN'T COMMIT ANY CRIME! I JUST WANTED TO FREE THEIR SOULS! And with Santini whisked away to prison, Betty decides to rollick in the weeds and save this lizard. Look, I told you it was weird and absurd. For my money, opera is Argento's last truly great film. While later titles like Stendhal Syndrome and Sleepless remind me of what once was, opera is the capstone of his golden era. It's got a little bit of everything that made that stretch so magical. The black love killer, the over-the-top set pieces, the expressionistic camera movements, and you can't forget the batshit insane plot lines that often felt like little more than an excuse to get us to the next kill or crazy shot. But can opera hit the high notes and earn a 5 barf bag rating? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, opera delivers. We're treated to a scissor bisection, one stabbed face, one plucked out eyeball, several stabbings, and that fantastic gunshot to the eye. Sergio Stivaletti's effects work is as great as we've come to expect, with just enough gruesome detail to earn opera four barf bags out of five. This is definitely a sick flick. Looking for more Golden Age Argento? Then check out my review of Phenomena. You'll find the link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.